Hey, welcome to our very first Thought Leader Thursday presented by Quality Executive Partners. We're a consulting and technology firm providing innovative solutions for the life sciences industry. I'm Tyler DeWitt and I'm Director of Innovation here. I'm really excited to lead this webinar. We're gonna be talking about airflow pattern studies. And I'm also tremendously honored to be joined by two of my colleagues. I'm joined by Bob Ferrer, an engineering chemist who's Vice President of Consulting Operations. And I'll also be presenting content featuring Vanessa Figueroa, who's the Executive Director of Microbiology here. So, Thought Leader Thursdays are a new initiative of ours where we're excited to bring you high quality educational content around topics critical to pharmaceutical manufacture. Today, uh, we'll discuss airflow studies utilizing our educational platform, Virtuosi. So Virtuosi launched in 2019, and it's, it's really transforming learning within the pharmaceutical industry. Virtuosi combines 2D video lectures and virtual reality or VR experiences. The first series of Virtuosi features a full 80 hour curriculum on aseptic manufacturing and microbiology. So in terms of what we're gonna do in the next couple of minutes, here's sort of the outline. We'll talk about best practices and execution for airflow studies. And we'll even give you the opportunity to visualize interacting with airflow and virtual reality. Uh, before we conclude, you'll be able to pose questions to our technical expert, Bob, uh, who will answer your questions about this, this very important topic. Now, just a little bit of bookkeeping about how the question and answer is going to work. All of you have the ability to ask questions during this webinar. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have the capability right now to do live questions, but we ask you to submit any questions you have for Bob, and we'll address those at the end. So here's how you're going to do it. If you take a look at the webinar screen, on, in the upper right-hand corner, there's this, this small little control panel that has an orange arrow at the top. You click on that orange arrow, and it's going to expand this menu box. Look down in the menu box, you find the question section, you can type in your questions, and submit them. At the end, we'll go to Bob and we'll have him answer as many as we have time for. So please, throughout this webinar, anything that you wanna know more about, submit a question and we really look forward to hearing from you. But going back to airflow studies, uh, to kick it off, I wanna turn things over to our technical expert, Bob. Bob's got 30 years of industry experience involving the design, build, startup, management of facilities it's specializing in aseptic manufacturing. And I've got this slide up here, why? At QXP, all of our educational approaches start with a fundamental why. And in this case, I wanna bring, I wanna bring Bob in to tell us the why behind, the, the why behind airflow studies. Bob, why, why is this such an important topic? Well, Thanks, Tyler. Um, you know, so airflow studies are, are incredibly important because they enable us to visualize how uh, air moves within the environment, right? So after a facility design is complete, we finish our commissioning. Um, we, we then need a mechanism to be able to see how the air is moving over open containers, over open products, uh, and really regulators, I mean, it's a regulatory requirement, right? Can't get around it. So um, it's, it's critically important that we have this, uh, this tool uh, in our bag where we introduce a visible smoke and then see how it uh, uh, behaves within the environment. So tell me about patient safety. Right. It's ultimately all about the patient. It's all about the safety of the patient. How does understanding airflow have an impact on patient safety? Well, so everything that we do, I mean, in our industry, it's all about patient safety, right? First protect the product and then protect the patient, right? So um, airflow uh, and the importance of the airflow study is to make sure that we have appropriate airflow that, that comes down in a unidirectional manner, floods the open containers and product uh, uh, components, product contact components with what we call first air, and then flushes that air away. And it really is, is the main mechanism, especially for aseptic processing, as well as even terminal sterilization processes to ensure that we uh, that we 
provide the, the uh, most protection over the product uh, critical areas. That's awesome. So that's some great introduction to the why of why this is so important. Let's now dive into some of the background. And for this, we're gonna take a look at a little bit of the content from the Virtuosi Air Pattern Studies episode. Uh, this segment that I'm gonna show you in just a second is presented by my colleague, Vanessa Figueroa. She has worked in the pharmaceutical, biotechnology, medical device industry, and she has really extensive experience in sterility assurance, environmental and utilities monitoring programs, and, and quality control laboratory management. So in this short segment that I'm gonna share, Vanessa is gonna tell us some of the background information on airflow patterns. As I queue up this video, uh, it's gonna take just a minute or two and your screen might change to black. Uh, that's completely normal. And in just a minute, we'll hear from Vanessa telling us some of the background information on airflow and engineering methods related to airflow. Engineering methods provide the ability to maintain control of our clean spaces. But how does this practically apply in the various operating environments we have in our manufacturing facilities? Airflow in clean rooms can be classified into three patterns, unidirectional, non-unidirectional, and mixed airflow. Absolute measures of airflow velocity and exchange rates per hour, although important, may not be as useful as visualizing and evaluating air movement within the operating environment. Therefore, it has become an industry best practice to evaluate airflow through the creation and implementation of studies utilizing visible smoke. Let's review the three types of airflow patterns in detail. Unidirectional airflow is used in critical areas such as ISO 5 or in laboratory testing hoods where the first air that comes into contact with open product, open containers, container closures, or product samples is required to be of the highest purity possible. The principle of first air is one of the most basic principles in aseptic technique. This principle states that humans interacting in the environment should never disrupt the unidirectional airflow over open containers, product contact components, or samples. Maintaining first air minimizes the potential for contamination and ultimately protects the product and therefore patient health. We will review the principle of first air in more detail later in this episode. Unidirectional airflow is created by complete coverage of the supply area with HEPA filters. As you can see in the image, which is depicting a filling room, the air under the ISO 5 space is physically separated from the ISO 7 space via rigid plastic walls known as RADs, or Restricted Access Barrier System. The air passes over the filling line, exits the space, and is captured by the low wall returns and the air is removed from the working environment. Unidirectional airflow is also referred to as laminar airflow. Sometimes the standalone equipment are called laminar airflow hoods, abbreviated as LAF. Unidirectional airflow can either be vertical or horizontal, depending on the work to be performed and the process configuration. The image here depicts a horizontal LAF that could be used in a laboratory setting. Non-unidirectional airflow is created by having HEPA filters not adjacent to each other. As shown, there is ceiling space where there are no filters. Non-unidirectional airflow is also referred to as turbulent airflow. In the zones surrounding ISO 5 and preparatory areas such as ISO 8, the principal means of particulate control is via dilution. Air coming from the HEPA filter generally passes from the ceiling to a low wall return, where the air is then captured and removed from the working environment. While it is still appropriate practice to not lean over open vessels or material that are being prepared, the nature of turbulent airflow means that particles can move in multiple directions. Mixed airflow is a combination of the two types of airflow in the same manufacturing space as shown.
and that was Vanessa uh, presenting this content on uh, some of the background content on Airflow. Now, I'd be remiss not to mention that there is another performer in these videos. You might have noticed some hands pointing out important things on that screen. Uh, those are actually my hands. Uh, Vanessa and I co-presented a lot of the information for Virtuosi. And so when one of us is in front of the camera talking about this content, the other was seated in front of a screen pointing out some of these important concepts. So later on, uh, you'll see a video where we've, we've switched places. Uh, I think Vanessa's performance in that video was, was definitely uh, better than the, the performance of my hands there. Uh, going back, though, to another member of our team, uh, I want to bring in Bob. Um, Bob, uh, really being one of the uh, engineering subject matter experts here, was really closely involved in the development of, of Virtue OC as a whole, but particularly uh, in the engineering-related episodes of Virtue OC. And, and Bob, I, I want to hear from you a bit more about sort of how you decided to present the information in this episode and how you how you wanted to structure the learn and I, I i'm particularly interested in the connections that you wanted to make here and uh the content that we just saw from vanessa how does that connect with what an operator should be aware of you know how does it connect with maybe just sort of the day-to-day -day of, of plant operations yeah so when we set out to to create virtuosi uh, the idea behind it was we wanted to make it relatable to uh, to everyone, right? And most important, we wanted to, to, to focus on the why, as you mentioned before, um, because we believe that everybody wants to do the right thing, um, but sometimes they don't know what the right thing is and they don't understand how their impact or their actions uh, can impact the environment or, or impact the product and, and obviously therefore patients. So we wanted to focus on how airflow can be disrupted um, to help educate the, the, the people who are not typically involved in smoke studies or who are not typically uh, able to go in and, and experiment with uh, with airflow uh, this is a way for them to um, learn about that right and as I mentioned before you know air is essentially invisible in real life uh, unless unless there is smoke in the air and we've all seen you know situations where you can see smoke rising or you can see things moving right. but um, that's that's not normally the case but this is where VR is able to come in uh, and help us right um, and to, to understand airflow, we have to go beyond just a, an airflow protocol study execution, right? It's, it's about how do you create air suitable for a clean room? How do you ensure that you're removing particulate in the right manner? Uh, how, how do we control the environment? So I also set out to try and uh, relay some important engineering principles as part of uh, the education in, in a way that's relatable and understandable to everybody. I wanted to make sure that I educated people on first air principles, on uh, filtration, on the multiple layers of filtration that we use, room conditioning, differential pressures, room air changes, all of these things together, um, you know, make, make uh, everyone powerful. When you have knowledge, it's power, right? And with that knowledge, you can then understand the right things to do. Um, you know, we have SOPs that tell us what to do as a rote process and, you know, follow this instruction, follow that instruction. And when everything goes according to plan, no problems, no deviations, right? Exactly. <laughs> but it, it's right. when we don't follow the instruction or if, or if something unexpected happens that then things uh, go awry. So it's for this reason that Virtuosi was, was developed to allow all people uh, to participate and get the feel for airflow patterns and their actions on, on, on airflow. Now, you said two things that really interested me that I want to circle back on. Number one was that, you know, we can't really see airflow in mm -hmm. just day-to-day -day situations. Um, but then you talked about, and you know, this is really a key part of the Virtuosi experience, you talked about how using virtual reality technologies can be really effective in giving people a sense of how air flows, even though it's usually invisible, it, it, even though it's usually invisible. Can you, can you tell, tell a little bit more about how we incorporated that into Virtuosi? Sure. So within Virtuosi, and I think it's the next segment you're going to show, Tyler. Yes. Uh, yep. We're going to we're going to show uh, what we've created in VR uh, to allow people to experiment. Uh, you know, visualizing airflow. I mean, can you imagine sending someone into an ISO 5 clean room with a smoke generator and saying, "Go blow some smoke around and see what happens"? Just, just as right, right, right. Move your hands and see yeah. how it affects the eddies. Yeah. Absolutely. I, 
we, we would never do that, right? We would never deliberately or, or even potentially allow airflow, uh, a clean room to become contaminated. So by creating this in VR, uh, we have the ability to give everyone an opportunity to see this firsthand. And, and what you're going to see, even though it's, um, uh, it's, it's a 2D recording of, of me in a VR headset, uh, doing the experience, uh, what you see with the smoke is real. It's different every time. It's not like it's a video of the smoke. I mean, obviously the experience is a video, but as you can see in my office, I mean, I've got you know VR set up and you may even notice I've got paper all over every reflective surface uh, in my office. And for those of you who might uh, have some experience with VR, you know that VR does not like reflections. So, uh, you know, these big poster boards covering up everything in my office that, that could reflect uh, really helps me you know, work with the development team and, and create these experiences. Um, so what, what you're about to see, uh, even though it's it doesn't, you know, give you the full, you know, VR experience, it will give you a feeling of, of what it's like to be in the VR. So maybe you can queue up that video, Tyler. Yeah, yeah, let's go ahead and show that. Um, and something uh, that I'll just point out as I, as I pull this up is, you know, what is so cool uh, is, is the ability to play with this stuff. And so people put on the VR headset and they can move their digital arms around and really get sort of an intuitive sense of how air responds to their movements, how they affect it. And that's the sort of thing that you're, you know, you're never going to get by reading an SOP or right. that, you know, you're just going to understand even by reading something out of a textbook, right? The ability to experiment is, is what I, I think, you know, makes it so powerful. So, so let's take a look at, 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 at Bob in the virtual, virtual reality headset experimenting with, with airflow. Before examining the effect equipment and supplies can have on airflow, let's spend some time examining your influence on airflow. Here are some suggestions on what you might want to try with one or both hands. Pull the trigger to make a fist and insert your fist into the airstream and notice the large disturbance above and below your hand. Also note that the impact of the airflow occurs in all directions. If you look carefully, you will see that the smoke is also flowing away from you and towards you. Although the smoke is provided on a single plane as a so-called curtain of smoke, we need to remember that there is air all around us and that the effects of airflow disturbance will flow in all directions. Unclench your fist by pulling the trigger again and hold your hand first parallel to the floor of the filler, then perpendicular to the floor of the filler to examine the difference that a narrow profile can make. Now move your hand quickly and note the large disturbance. Note that after each disruption, that there is a recovery period for unidirectional airflow to resume. Now, what you just saw, I, I wanted to re-emphasize what Bob said. You know, this, this is a recording, uh, but it's a recording of somebody in a VR headset having this virtual reality experience. So uh, uh, the interactions, they're not scripted. Uh, this isn't a video. This is, the, this is the virtual environment reacting in real time. Uh, to you know, to whatever a user might be doing. You know, I, I hesitate to use the word gaming, right? Because that sort of conjures an image of something that's not so serious. But 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 this is um, like the immersive environments that we see in gaming, uh, where where you can essentially do whatever you want. Uh, you can make mistakes. You can learn from those mistakes, and, and that's really ultimately you know how people build. Uh, a metal model of the world around them. And that, that's how they sort of intuitively begin to understand how air is flowing and how their actions might affect it. Um, so that's particularly from, from my background in, in, in education and in technology and also you know, in microbiology, I get really excited about thinking about how these sort of educational tools can let people you know, sort of better visualize and understand their impact on the world around them. So the thing that I would like to show next uh, is a continuation of this virtual reality experience. Uh, in this, we're going to move beyond looking at uh, personnel influence on airflow. And we're going to see, again, through an interactive, immersive experience, we're going to see how, how, objects, uh, how objects affect airflow.
flow in this sort of an environment. And this will help us to better understand how equipment and various things, you know, that might be inside of RABS, how that would affect the airflow and essentially how to best design equipment or how best to think about a space to disturb this unidirectional airflow as little as possible. So let's take a look at that. Uh, another VR video focused on objects and uh, pieces of equipment in an ISO 5 environment. Now let's examine cause and effect. For this immersive activity, you will be working inside of the RABs with different shapes to look at how they change the airflow patterns under ISO 5. We have removed the filler for this activity to simplify the geometry inside of the RABs so that you might better visualize the airflow patterns. Place the large white cube in the center of the table, where indicated by the blue outlined shadow. What do you think best describes the likely motion of the unidirectional flow around the large cube? Do you think, A, that it will flow smoothly and in a unidirectional fashion around the cube? Or do you think, B, that it will cause turbulence above the cube only? Or do you think, C, that it will cause turbulence above and at the sides of the cube? The correct answer is C, that it creates turbulence both above and at the sides of the cube. Large flat surfaces create a barrier to airflow that can result in turbulence in the form of eddies and reflux at the surface. As more air flows down, those eddies are forced to the sides and interrupt the air along the upper sides of the cube as well. Next. Place the small white cube in the center of the table where indicated by the blue outline shadow. What do you think best describes the likely motion of the unidirectional flow around the small cube? Do you think A. That it will flow smoothly and in a unidirectional fashion around the cube? Or do you think B. That it will cause turbulence above the cube only? Or do you think C. That it will cause turbulence above and at the sides of the cube? The correct answer is B, with only instantaneous occurrences of C. The smaller the surface, even if flat, the less turbulence in the form of eddies and reflux at the surface. Due to the small amount of disruption at the upper surface, the air is forced in a more unidirectional pattern down the sides of the cube, with very little interruption. Does position matter? What if we take our smaller surface and move it up against a wall or another surface? Move the cube to the back wall of the RABS to the right, above your head. Note that the small cube which was successful as a standalone object is less successful when it abuts a surface such as the enclosure wall. By creating a side where the air can no longer flow away from the cube, we have reduced the surfaces over which the displaced air might smoothly flow, which leads to more turbulence on top of the cube. Knowing that less surface area reduces turbulence, and that positioning is important, what else might reduce turbulence? Turn the large cube so that it is standing on one of its edges, as indicated by the blue highlighted shadow, and watch what occurs with the airflow. Facing an edge into the airstream, with sloped edges off to either side, permits the air to flow smoothly across the faces of the cube and continue down to the table. While there is some turbulence in the region under the cube, this can be fixed by filling that area in. Before you fill in the area under the cube, take a good look at the airflow behavior below the cube to observe the turbulence. Remember that you can move around to improve your perspective. When you are ready, select Continue to make a rectangular filler piece appear. Note that the minor turbulence observed under the cube has now been resolved. This sloped surface and the lack of turbulence is one of the reasons that many clean room surfaces, such as control cabinets and pass-throughs, are designed to have sloped tops rather than flat tops. There is less disruption of airflow with this design, and the smooth flow across the surface prevents particulate from accumulating in these locations.
let's review some of the key learnings from this immersive. Vertical unidirectional airflow is disturbed by large flat surfaces that are presented perpendicular to the airflow, whether elevated close to the HEPA or lower within the controlled space. Improvements to airflow can be made by reducing the size of the surface, thereby disrupting a smaller amount of the overall airflow. Improvements to airflow can also be made by presenting large surfaces at an oblique angle to the direction of the airflow, such as when the cube was presented on edge, creating sloped rather than flat surfaces to the airstream. Perforating the surface to permit air to move through the object can also improve airflow, although be aware that perforated surfaces can present cleaning challenges. Other geometry changes, such as moving the object away from other surfaces like the wall of the enclosure to permit airflow all around the object, can also reduce turbulence. Rounding a surface will also promote less turbulence, although unidirectional airflow is still not present directly below the object. Select Continue to proceed with the horizontal airflow demonstration. Now, we don't have time to get into it right now, but you'll uh, notice the end. Uh, the narration mentions a horizontal airflow experience. Uh, and in that case, a, a user is sitting in front of a laminar airflow hood, uh, and they're learning uh, the principles of first air in that sort of an environment, and learning best practices for laboratory manipulations and, and, and things of that matter. Um, as I've said, you know, the, these, these are immersive virtual reality experiences. And so the recording doesn't fully do justice to the experience, but still, I, I think that what we saw was tremendous. You're actually able to visualize how air is moving. You can see the eddies, you can see the unidirectional flow. I, I think just as videos, these are, these are tremendous. I mean, I, I've never seen something like this in a textbook. I've never seen something like this in, in an educational video. You know, you really get the sense how the hands, how the objects are affecting airflow in this environment. Um, Bob, as as the sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, director or producer, as you might, of this particular episode, I want to hear a little bit more about what would be next, sort of from a teaching perspective. When you are putting it all together, we think about what we've seen. We've seen some of the background, engineering methods, different types of airflow. Then we introduce some of these interactive experiences so, so people can kind of get a sense of really how their actions affect airflow. They can get sort of an intuitive sense of it. What comes next? What did you decide to put, put after this? Right. So um, just to put it into context, uh, you know, this this particular episode, I think, was broken down into 12 segments. Uh, and that first uh, video that we had of, uh, of Vanessa was actually segment eight. So there was a lot of preliminary information that came long before, you know, Vanessa introduced the introduced the type of airflow. Um, and what we tried to do is we tried to build it along sequentially so that as we were talking about, you know, here's facility, here's facility design, here's engineering principles. And now, OK, let's see. What, what actually happens, which is what uh, what you've just shown with those videos, the next thing we would do is actually design uh, an airflow pattern study, right? So right. documented protocol, predefined acceptance criteria, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and those uh, sorts of topics. So I believe this next segment that we're going to show is actually going to describe um, how we actually create the study. All right, let's take a look at this. This is a video where uh, Vanessa and I have switched places. I'm in front of the camera, uh, and you'll see Vanessa's hands as she points out some of the important things on the, uh, on the video that we're also playing. All regulatory agencies require that each individual pharmaceutical company define those engineering key operational parameters used to ensure that an environment is suitable for its intended purpose. These key operational parameters should have been developed, designed, commissioned, and qualified by a cross-functional team to ensure that all aspects of routine manufacturing operations and quality requirements are accounted for. Previously, when we discussed engineering design, we learned that guidance documents provide recommendations to industry. This guidance outlines regulatory expectations for certain operational values, such as airflow velocity and differential pressure. While these values are specifically stated in guidance documents, simply achieving them does not ensure that an environment is suitable. 
every facility has some unique features that would require adaptation and justification to the values stated in regulatory documents. Companies design procedures and protocols intended to maintain the appropriate environmental cleanliness and to prevent contamination. These methods must be documented and it must be shown that they function as designed. This happens through testing and data collection. Smoke studies are one type of supporting data that's used to demonstrate airflow in the proper direction. In order to ensure the highest quality environment possible in a clean room, multiple engineering design and operating parameters must function in concert with each other. A smoke study is a useful way to visualize air movement in a properly operating clean room. In a smoke study, smoke or a similar material is added to the air and it helps us see what the air is doing and how it's flowing. For a properly operating clean room, the correct air volume must be supplied to ensure sufficient air changes. The correct air velocity must be supplied to ensure that particles are swept away from critical zones. All of these factors ensure that there is unidirectional airflow and that particles do not enter the critical zone. Filter integrity testing is required to ensure that HEPA filters are capable of retaining particulate. This test uses an upstream aerosol challenge. The filter face is then scanned for leaks. This will ensure that there are no holes in the filter material or leaks from the surrounding seals. The correct volume of air must be removed from the room to ensure a correct differential pressure cascade. And lastly, the temperature and relative humidity must be appropriate not only for the product, but also for the comfort of the employees who are working within the clean room. The visualization of airflow via smoke studies is an important part of the overall qualification of a clean room, specifically for ISO 5 spaces with unidirectional airflow. In summary, smoke studies are important to demonstrate that air is unidirectional where needed, that there is minimal turbulence in the critical zones, that the air leaves the critical zones and is forced towards low wall returns, and that the low wall returns adequately remove air from a given design space. Smoke studies are also useful to visualize the airflow in critical zones when interventions occur. The smoke study should also demonstrate how air moves in critical zones when doors open and close. In addition to the critical zones, smoke studies should be performed around doors between adjacent rooms. Now that we have a basic understanding of regulatory expectations for clean rooms and how the clean room should function, let's discuss some of the documentation, materials, and tools we need to conduct smoke studies. Like any other qualification study, a smoke study is performed as a qualification test to confirm if airflow occurs as it was designed to. Smoke studies also examine whether airflow is appropriate to protect the product from contamination. Ultimately, preventing contamination in the product protects patient safety. Prior to initiating a formal smoke study, significant commissioning activities must be performed. These will include ensuring the HVAC system is operating properly, executing successful HEPA filter integrity testing, confirming that HEPA filter differential pressures are within acceptable ranges, and ensuring that both the velocity and volume of air supplied via the HEPA filters are set to appropriate design parameters. It's very useful to use informal smoke testing during commissioning to aid in the setup of the system. Operating values that are defined in the commissioning process will become part of SOPs governing the HVAC system, and these values must be verified during qualification studies. Smoke studies are performed as part of the initial startup of a manufacturing facility, and they will be used throughout the area's life cycle. Smoke studies will be used for initial qualifications and to support modifications and change controls, so it's imperative the thought be given to capturing information that will be needed for future decisions. Smoke studies should be performed for all ISO 5 areas and any ISO 7 areas that directly impact the ISO 5 areas. In general, ISO 8 areas don't require smoke studies. ISO 7 areas that are segregated from the ISO 5 areas may not require smoke studies, but these decisions should be documented and justified with a site protocol or master plan. Typically, Smoke studies are performed individually for each manufacturing line. Special care should be taken to ensure that a smoke study performed in one area of a facility does not impact any adjoining areas that are currently operational. 
these areas could be contaminated with smoke or their air pressure differentials could be disturbed. Smoke studies may also be used to support failure investigations or to perform investigations for potential process improvements prior to implementation. The ability to visualize the flow of air in critical areas has enormous value. For this reason, regulators place a strong emphasis on smoke studies for assessing potential contamination. The design and execution of a smoke study depend on when and where the smoke study will be performed. Risks to ongoing operations must be understood and balanced. For example, if a company is only going to test the critical manufacturing zones in a specific ISO 5 area on a filling line, and the smoke study wouldn't impact other adjacent areas, testing might be conducted during routine operations in other areas. Conversely, if there's potential impact to other operational areas of the facility, the smoke study may have to be performed during a period of non-commercial manufacturing. Well, so you Bob, know, Tyler, tell us a little bit more about what we saw there. Oh, sorry, yeah. you go ahead. No, that's okay. Um, you know, watching you present that reminded me of when we were all down in Atlanta and, uh, you know, doing uh, multiple episodes, one after the other for days on end. And, and I remember, you know, Judy, the teleprompter operator, you know, starting to chime in on some of the things that she was just picking up from, from you know, listening to us, you know, people are the greatest source of contamination, don't break first air, you know, all of these really important messages that, that we're trying to, to bring in. And, yeah, we, we you know, educated the whole film crew exactly. about pharmaceutical manufacturing it was it was incredible <laughs> yeah so you know it, it 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 was just a great feeling watching people who are just there you know supporting us you know filming uh you know picking up what we were laying down so to speak so you know it was really great but you know that that episode that we just looked at i mean it's just a small piece of i think that was segment 11 uh you know where we started to talk about the protocol the design uh, you know, the, the execution, you know, some, some watch outs and things like that. Uh, but I think in the interest of time, maybe we should just skip and, and do one more little part where we talk about uh, the protocol objectives. Okay, let's take a okay. quick look at that. And then uh, just to remind everybody, after we look at this short segment, we will uh, we'll do a question and answer with Bob. So make sure that if you have any questions, you, uh, you type them into that question box and, and we'll get through as many as we can right after this segment. So we look forward to hearing all of your questions. Regardless of when or why a smoke study is performed, the objective is to examine the patterns of airflow in a room or work area by visualizing the air movement using smoke. The goals are to show that air flows in conformance with design criteria and that there's no refluxing of air into the critical area. Refluxing air would leave and then come back into the area. Refluxing airflow is in many ways the opposite of unidirectional airflow, and it's very important to pay attention to. Once air passes the critical zone where containers are open and product is being filled, the air should not re-enter this area. Smoke studies will also demonstrate if there are dead zones in critical areas. Dead zones are areas where there is minimal airflow or none at all, and the identification of dead zones points out areas where increased environmental monitoring might be warranted. Ideally, there would be no dead zones in an ISO 5 area, but sometimes equipment configuration can cause a dead zone. Smoke studies can also be used to examine whether positive or negative pressure differentials might be present in the area. Pressure differentials may exist between adjacent spaces when doors are closed, they may be found around wall and ceiling penetrations, and they may be located around designed conveyor exits, which are sometimes referred to as mouse holes. Airflow should be recorded both at rest and under operational conditions. These conditions would include the routine interventions that occur during manufacturing, as well as the opening and closing of doors during personnel and material movement. These objectives will directly translate to the acceptance criteria of the protocol. We're just waiting for uh, Tyler to come back and, and rejoin us. And here we go. Uh, and here we if, go. This were, if this were in Virtuosi, 
uh, after uh, we went through various segments, uh, you'd receive credit for each one uh, as they're completed. Uh, you'd take a knowledge assessment, there'd be uh, uh, questions and, and that, things of that nature. Um, instead of uh, us asking uh, you questions, uh, we'd like to flip it now and encourage uh, you all to ask us, uh, particularly our technical expert, Bob, any questions that you have about uh, airflow pattern studies, any of the content that you've seen today, or uh, any any applications of this content that you can think of. We're getting a whole bunch of really good questions come in. Please keep submitting them. We'll get through as many as we can. Um, Bob, this one, uh, this one I noticed right away. Uh, you know, you've you've probably taken you've you've, you've probably uh, been involved in in many many uh, airflow studies or smoke studies, as they're sometimes called. And this question here asks, um, what are some of the biggest issues that you personally um, have seen in smoke studies? Uh, that's a, that's a good question. Um... Well, the first thing that jumps to mind is uh, where I've seen people try and use contrasting materials to try and increase the visibility of the smoke. Uh, as you can imagine, we design our filling rooms for filling products, not necessarily for uh, you know uh, filming, right? Like in a film studio. So uh, trying to film smoke, which tends to be white in color against stainless steel in a highly lit background, uh, proves to be difficult. Uh, you know, many times. So we try and adjust lighting balance. We try and adjust, you know, other things in the room that don't impact airflow. But sometimes people try and uh, put up some dark background to enable to see the smoke as it's moving. And what I've seen is sometimes inadvertently uh, that background might be set up in a way which um, interferes with the with the airflow movement itself, which is, of course, not not desirable and not acceptable. I'd say the second big thing that I've seen is um, Smoke that's generated at a at a height, and that by the time it gets down to the working surface, which is really where we care about you know visualizing the smoke, uh, it starts to dissipate. And you know uh, some of the generation methods, uh, you know the, the the density of the smoke, if you will, uh, tends to dissipate, especially if you start it you know many feet above uh, you know the the line in a in a rabs or in an isolator. Uh, but conversely, I've also seen this other problem, Tyler, where you know, you then overcompensate and you try and generate too much smoke, right? So, so now you've got this, you know, large generator pumping out massive amounts of smoke and it's flowing down. And now when we're trying to visualize it or, or, or videotape it, I'm looking through a depth of smoke and I really can't see what's happening at that intervention, you know, what's happening at that critical work surface. And that was one of the reasons why in Virtuosi we deliberately only put that one plane or one column of smoke down so that you can see it very clearly because obviously if it was if it had not only width but depth it becomes very very difficult uh, to visualize as you can imagine. Uh, great 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 information to share. This is this is so cool for me to, you know, hear hear your perspective on, on the things that you've seen. Um, Here's here's a good question that just came in. Um, okay, what is typical smoke study acceptance criteria for an ISO seven background space to ISO five? Mm, that that is a very good question. Um, oh, so I, I guess I guess in general, what we want to make sure is that obviously air doesn't move from the ISO seven space into the ISO five space. Right. So, I mean, that's that's one of the basic things that we're always showing unidirectional airflow protecting the most critical space. And we have unidirectional airflow in ISO five. And in ISO seven, we would typically have uh, I, I'll call it a more turbulent airflow. Uh, we tried to depict it in the uh, in the diagram, you know, a little bit. But air still moves from the top comes down and is generally taken out through the low wall return, but it doesn't have that same velocity that we use in an ISO 5 space to actually generate that, that unidirectional flow. So as far as acceptance criteria, you know, the first thing is, um, you know, can't move, you know, from ISO 7 back into ISO 5. I would say other criteria that we would have to apply would really be dependent upon the specific uh, equipment configuration design and process. So it, it becomes a little bit more 
difficult to answer, uh, you know, in much more detail other than protection of that critical ISO-5 zone. Uh, but I could see that there would be other, uh, other issues where we're doing uh, material transport or material handling to make sure that we don't have reflux, to make sure that as we're moving things in, uh, we're not disrupting airflow. So as a general answer, I think that's, that's probably about uh, as detailed as I can get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's another question that I'd, I'd like to, to bring up now because it, it's kind of related to the one that you just talked about. And, and, and the question is this, how would you approach smoke studies um, in grade B non-laminar rooms where the critical environments are biosafety cabinets? So, so the biosafety cabinet is located in the grade B space. Is that is that the I question? Assume that's what the, I assume that's what okay. the question is. Okay. Well, well, let, let's assume that that's the question. I'll answer the question of a biosafety cabinet, which tends to be ISO five inside, in a grade right. B room surrounding, and I'm I'm working in it. Well, biosafety right, right, right. cabinets uh, are specifically designed for for two purposes. One is it protects the operator from the process that they're working on, and it protects the product from the operator in the external environment. You may recall that you saw a picture of a horizontal laminar airflow hood uh, in what Ves Vanessa was presenting before. Right. That type of design where the air moves horizontally out towards the operator is absolutely not suitable for anything where the uh, uh, the material under test could affect the operator. We use that stuff, uh, laminar airflow cabinets, for things like uh, water testing, let's say where protection of the operator is not important. So once we understand that a biological safety cabinet is designed to protect both product and uh, operator, we can then start to think about what criteria might apply, right? So the biosafety cabinet itself has to keep its air within, right? And it has to keep the air from the outside from getting in, right? right. So oftentimes we have critical settings on on these units not only on fan settings and filter differential pressure settings within the bsc but there's also a sash that goes down in front uh, to protect us right so typically uh, and i can't really show you because i'm working below my uh, my video camera now but my hands would go underneath the sash yeah. the sash would be in front of me and what that does is it ensures that the air that any air from the outside uh, doesn't get in and usually right at the front of the biological safety cabinet both on the bottom sometimes on the sides there's air intake so again to answer a, as, as, as specifically as I can with the general question what we're trying to do again is show that that separation from the outside to the inside that no air from the outside gets to the inside no air from the inside gets to the outside and from an equipment perspective making sure that the biological safety cabinet all of its operating parameters are being met and alarms are working properly especially with that sash height all right so now let's step back and get a little bit more general um, here's a question I see a number of people asking sort of variants of these. And, and the question is, um, you know, for smoke studies, what is, is the best, you know, quote unquote, smoke generation to use? And, and what are maybe some of the pros and cons of the different types of smoke? Yeah, I, I, I would have to say that the answer is not best. The answer is pros and cons, right? So, right. so with every generation method, you've got pros and cons, and quite honestly, you might choose to use more than one type uh, given your specific facility and equipment configuration. So a uh, common one is uh, propylene glycol mixed with WFI, uh, usually heated up. Yep. Uh, sometimes we call that theatrical smoke. Um, that gives you a nice dense smoke that you can distribute over a, over a wide area. It doesn't dissipate rapidly, uh, but it does leave residues behind. So after the um, execution of the smoke study, there's going to need to be a, a fairly intensive cleanup because it's, it tends to leave an oily residue. Uh, and the longer the smoke study goes on, the, the more residue there is. Um, other techniques use um, like a, a water for injection in, in a vaporizer or an atomizer, which now leaves no, no residue to speak of, but that smoke tends to, tends to dissipate rapidly. Um, Back in the day, uh, and I don't want to say how many days ago, but you know, way back, uh, we used to use dry ice in, in in water, and that would generate smoke. But the problem with carbon dioxide is it's heavy, it's right, cold, yeah. exactly. So so now we've got gravity moving the smoke, uh, not the the airflow in, in the room moving the smoke. And really, what we're looking for is this happy medium between neutral buoyancy of the smoke, so that we can visualize the airflow, uh, and again, non-contaminating and and non 
uh, uh, you know, non-dissipating to, to give us a good visualization. That's why I'm saying sometimes in some areas you might use one, one type of generation method, in other areas you might use another generation method. Right, uh, here, here's another question uh, that is sort of general and it's moving back to sort of thinking about this in, a, in, in, in more of a regulatory setting. And the question is, um, what conditions or events would require the requalification of an ISO 5 area? Um, and uh, uh, what follow-up to a, a significant contamination breach needs to occur? Those are sort of two separate questions. So maybe, uh, yeah. maybe you want to start with a, the requalification of, of the ISO 5 area. Yeah, so um, again, it's it's a, a broad question that I'll try and you know give uh, give as, as narrow an answer to. Um, when we talk about ISO 5 qualification, there's probably two different things that people are thinking about. One is qualification according to ISO 14644, um, which is really a particulate and environmental classification, and the other one is let's say the the qualification of the HVAC system and uh, its operation, including HEPA filter integrity testing. Uh, velocities, volumes, uh, I'm trying to think what else I haven't said yet. Uh, uh, did I say differential pressure across filters? I don't remember. But, you know, th those are two separate things. So, uh, it, according to the, the new draft of Annex 1, which is uh, still in review, uh, there's actually some, some wording in there that talks about uh, requalifying the clean room from a particular classification. And I think that we're all as an industry trying to really determine what's the best way to go about doing that because we've got an environmental monitoring program that, that's continually monitoring the environment, but usually that's less locations than what would typically be, be required according to that ISO guidance. Um, so if we take that as one part, and say that that needs to be done periodically, maybe annually. Um, and then you look at the uh, other function or the other part that I was describing, the engineering physical functions. Uh, typically we do HEPA filter integrity testing in an ISO 5 area uh, two times per year. Uh, and at the same time that we do the integrity testing is when we check uh, volumes or velocities as appropriate. We check uh, room air changes. We might check, uh, well, I shouldn't say we might, we would check differential pressures. So those are really the things that we would check. Now, if there was a, a significant change to the system, uh, I had uh, changed out a fan, a major fan in my air handler or a major component of the air handler, that might uh, warrant some requalification of, uh, of that mechanical system. Um, but I think if we separate the two and talk about, you know, the HVAC mechanical, and then we talk about the other part being the environmental, uh, hopefully I gave the person who asked the question, uh, you know, enough detail uh, to, to, to get them on that. Now, I believe the second question was about contamination. And can you read that part to me again? Yeah, so unfortunately, or did it scroll off the screen? there have been, yeah, there have been so many other, oh, okay, yeah. so right, here it is, here it is. And the follow-up was, what what follow-up is required well I'll, I'll i'll read it as as stated uh what follow-up to a significant contamination breach needs to occur Oof. well first of all i mean you have to start with a thorough investigation um and when i hear the word breach um, again, not understanding the context, but when I hear the word breach, I usually think of a physical breach. Uh, someone took a mop handle and accidentally poked it through a HEPA filter. Um, someone accidentally stepped off of a, a structurally supportive ceiling and put their foot through, you know, through the ceiling. Hey, it just happened, you know, three weeks ago at a site that <laughs> yeah, I was it at. Happened. Um, you know, these, these things happen, right? So when I hear the word breach, the first thing I think about is, is unintended but very obvious event. Um, in that case, obviously, you'd have to do a, a room requalification. You have no idea what contamination came into the room, the level of contamination. You might start with doing some monitoring to see how bad it is, or you might just rely on your, uh, what I would call a, a return to service procedure uh, to just you know, make your repairs and then bring that room back into service, which usually requires uh, a series of sequential cleanings followed by uh, disinfection, usually with sporocidal agents to make sure that, you know, the room's brought under control. Usually then there's some monitoring and then QA would, would evaluate the data uh, prior to release. And, and depending upon the significance of the event, you might do that under protocol. You might already have some process for these type of uh, extreme events, um, in which case you would just follow your procedure. Right, right. 
Well, thank you very much for uh, all this great information, Bob. We're, uh, we're almost out of time. Uh, we've gotten so many great questions. I'm, I'm sorry that we don't have enough time to, to get to all of them. We would love to, uh, to hear all of your feedback, any questions that you had that we didn't have time to get to. Please, please, please uh, send those along to us at info at virtuosivr.com. Uh, now, something that I do just want to mention is uh, we know we've been experiencing uh, some, some delays, a little bit of lags here. Uh, uh, my guess is that's because everyone's been you know, working from home over the past couple of weeks. Uh, and, and for future webinars, we definitely look forward to optimizing uh, this internet situation the best we can. Uh, speaking of future webinars, we're looking forward to many more of these uh, Thought Leader Thursday events. Next week, we're going to be doing one on microbiology laboratory, which is certainly very exciting for me as a microbiologist. We'll have uh, information coming out on that real soon, so keep an eye in your inbox uh, for an invitation to next week's microbiology-focused Thought Leader Thursday. So uh, in wrapping up, I just wanted to remind everybody that content we showed today, uh, both the instructional videos, the virtual reality recordings, are direct from our Virtuosi educational product. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, please visit us at virtuosivr.com or reach out to us for more information at info at virtuosi.com. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you in our next Thought Leader Thursday event. Take care. Thank you.